talking about the build of my Mini Viper, which is a 40 centimeter wingspan chuck glider converted for RC and FPV. I've placed it on my MacBook here just to give you some reference for scale. Please note that as this is designed as a chuck glider, it's going to take slightly more effort to build than a normal RC plane. It's completely solid and there is no space built for RC gear or FPV gear. In this video, we're going to cover my build process. We'll take a look at some flight footage, but first we'll look at a list of parts that I've used and the cost. This is a list of all the parts I used to build this Mini Viper, including the model itself. The total build cost was $186. However, this is just for the model, and it takes into account that you already have your FPV gear, your radio transmitter, suitable LiPos, battery charger, and any tools you might need for the build. Please note that this parts list is in the video description below, with links on where you can purchase all of these items. So before I start talking through the build, I just wanted to mention that this was kind of just a, a personal challenge that I took on to try and convert this chuck glider. Maybe the parts that I used were not the best and the process might not be the best way to build this plane, but this is the way I did it and it worked okay for me. To start with, I decided that the canopy I was gonna split into two pieces. The front part was gonna be glued in place permanently and the second part would be the removable canopy so I can place the battery inside. So I used this foam cutting tool that you can see in my hand there. It basically just melts the foam but I used this to start cutting out the place where I was going to put the battery. In this plane, I'm using a little Hobby King Graphene 500 milliamp four cell LiPo. And every now and then, I just placed this in while I was cutting away the foam just to make sure it's fitting properly. And eventually I had my battery bay. But to make sure that the canopy was gonna go back on top of this with the LiPo in, I also took a snap razor to the inside of that just cutting away a small part at a time until it would go back on with the LiPo in place. Next, I simply placed the servos where I wanted them and just drew a line round to cut them out. If you're gonna use the same servos as mine, then they are about the same thickness as the wing, so you can just cut a hole straight out and they'll fit flush. However, if I was building this again, I probably would have gone for some slightly smaller servos. Here are the servos installed in the wings. The Viper has two control surfaces at the back for the elevator, so at this point I was trying to decide if I wanted two servos at the back, or if I wanted to have one up front near the LiPo that was going to control both surfaces in one. I decided to go with this method as I thought having two servos at the back might make this slightly tail heavy, and also having only one server to control the elevator would mean it was a slightly lighter build. Next I looked at how I was going to install my flight controller. Now this is the main wing, and that black square that I've drawn with pen here, this is the area that can be seen when the main wing is attached to the fuselage. So this is where the wires will be coming through to the flight controller. Again, using my foam cutting tool, I made this space to install the Omnibus F4 Pro board, which will be running iNav. And then to secure it in place, I use these four standoffs, and the bottom parts of them are glued into the wing. So it's still removable by unscrewing the top parts. Now that the FC was in place, I started to install the components. So I've soldered directly onto the board without using pins. The servos are all connected to the board, but the power supply is through a mini two amp, five volt BEC. As you can see here, I've also installed the XT60, so that it comes just up into the battery bay. And also the FreeSky XM Plus, which is gonna sit underneath the wing, is also soldered. So in this picture, it's starting to look a little bit messy, but that was always gonna happen when you're trying to put so much gear in such a small aircraft. Anyway, in this shot here, you can see how I've routed the cables to the ESC around that pillar, cutting out little grooves so that they fit flush. In this picture of the underside of the aircraft, you can see where I've installed the ESC and the XM Plus. Again, I've cut into the model to install them so they are flush. At the end of the build, I'm gonna cover them in tape. Next, I installed this tiny little 4,100 kV Cobra motor. I did this using a 3D printed motor mount. I'll put a link to that in the video description. And then the motor mount is just glued to the back of the aircraft. In this picture, you can see that the motor wires are ready to solder to the ESC wires. Now, in my case, it didn't matter which way the motor was gonna spin because I was using these gem fan props uh, as linked in the video description, and the pack comes with four propellers, two clockwise, two counterclockwise. Uh, 
So whichever way it was going to spin, I was going to have the right prop for that scenario. However, if you're using a prop that is a particular direction, this is something you'll need to consider before soldering the cables. The ESC I'm using is a little B Opto 30 amp. The only reason I'm using it is because I had four of them spare from a quad that I destroyed a while back. To be honest, you probably don't need a 30 amp. I would say 20 amp ESC is fine for this build. So you can reduce some weight and cost there if you want to. This photo also shows where I've installed my TBS Unify Pro VTX. The reason I use this one is they're pretty good quality and they're just extremely light. At a later time, I also cut a nice channel for those wires and they'd be covered in tape to make the underside of the wing nice and smooth. Because I was aiming to get speeds of up to 200 km per hour out of this model, I decided it'd be a good idea to reinforce the main wings. So to do that, I just cut two small channels and then installed two carbon rods, as you can see in this photo. I used goop to secure that in place. This picture shows the final location I decided on for the elevator servo. There'll be two push rods going through to the tail where each one would be attached to their own elevator surface. Up the front here I installed the micro run cam swift. Uh, I just cut a small slot for it and hot glued that in. The cable for this is running through that front canopy and underneath the lipo. In this picture here you can see the plane is almost ready to fly now that I've installed control horns and linkages. To secure the hatch in place, I hot glued a carbon rod into the rear part of the canopy, and in the front part I hot glued in a antenna tube. This just simply slots into the tube, and then there is a magnet on the canopy, and another magnet on the fuse there to snap it into place. So the final touch is to get this thing ready for its first maiden attempt was to install the GPS on the top, the circular polarized antenna around the wing attached to the TBS Unify, and I've also glued the main wing to the fuselage. My first maiden attempt didn't go too well. I decided to have a half-hearted go at a bungee launch, which is something I never do, and it didn't go too well. After that, I decided to just to try and give it a throw, but that didn't go too well either. In fact, that snapped the plane at the point I'd already identified as probably the weakest part of the model. It was a clean break, so it was easy to glue back together, but I decided it was time to reinforce this part too. So again, I cut channels down both sides of the fuselage and gooped in these carbon fibre rods. At this point, I decided to do the same on the tail of the plane, and I glued in carbon fibre spars along the elevators. At this stage, I wanted to point out the location of the USB on the side of the flight controller. Now remember, I have glued this main wing to the fuselage now, so this flight controller is no longer accessible. However, what I did was, before I glued it in place, I cut a slot on the side of the fuselage so that I can still connect it to my computer and make configuration changes in iNav. The all-up weight of this model, now that it had the reinforcements and was mostly covered in tape, was 175 grams without the battery. The LiPo I'm using weighs 69 grams, and therefore the all up weight of this model is 244 grams. So it's one last check of the control surfaces before finally getting this thing in the air. I decided that the method for launching it was definitely gonna be high throttle and throw it straight up. Unfortunately the camera angle wasn't the best so you can't quite catch the maiden properly, but there it goes. Here is the launch again from FPV view. I'm using 73% throttle and it felt like a really easy launch. In a moment I'm about to put it into stabilised mode for the first time and as you can see the results are not as desired. After this flight I reduced the gain on the roll axis in iNav and later on I'll show you the positive impact that had. 40 seconds into my flight my first full throttle and at this point I reached 147 kilometers per hour. The model does need to use auto trim because it's not flying quite straight, but it's a bit harder to do that when you can't use a stabilised mode. At this point I decided even though it was going to be in manual mode, I would give auto trim a try. It did seem to improve things slightly. There were some light winds on this day and considering the size of the model and the fact that it only weighs 244 grams, I think it was coping quite well. 
during this flight I realised that my OSD wasn't quite how I'd like it. In fact, there were some parts missing off the bottom of the screen, so I couldn't see my milliamp usage or my amp draw, and also my GPS coordinates. So I'd fix that for the next flight. At this point, I decided to come in for a low pass and fly as close to myself as possible. I actually got a little bit closer than I wanted to, and it kind of made me jolt out of the way, kind of lost my bearings, and that resulted in an unintended landing. Okay, let's see that again, but from the view of my phone recording on the ground. Okay, so the stats for the first flight I'm pretty happy with. Max speed of 150 km per hour. The maximum current draw was 18 amps, and a flight time of 4 minutes and 14 seconds. I was quite happy with that considering I landed early and still had some battery left. Yep, bit of a bent nose from the unintentional landing. Bit of cow crap on the side of it. But, can't complain at that. Oh my god, summary's disappeared, but I saw that it hit 150 kilometers per hour was the max speed. A few changes made and one week later it was time for flight two. So earlier on when I entered stabilised mode I had a real terrible problem with the roll. So in the PID tuning tab on iNav, I reduced these figures as highlighted in red. This time when I entered angle mode, it was a lot smoother. There was still a little bit of oscillation, but I think I can get rid of that by using auto-tune on my next flight. After a five minute flight, it was time to play the game of how close can you land next to yourself. Second LiPo, flight three with the Viper. The next two passes are the Viper and the Mini Drac, and I did this to compare the sound difference. So now you can see I've made some changes to my OSD layout. First thing is I've moved some figures around so they're not overlapping with each other. Um, I've added my milliamps at the bottom here. And I've also put my amp draw next to my throttle percentage. My GPS coordinates are now at the top of the screen, so these are recorded on the DVR. You can see here on launch, I'm using around 73% throttle again, and pulling around 10 amps. I am launching this plane in manual mode, and will continue to do so every time. As you can see from this bit of footage, it's able to fly nice and low and stable now that the trimming is sorted. If someone was to tell me that this was a bigger wing, such as an AR, just from this OSD footage, I'd probably believe them. At this point here, it's quite interesting to take a look at the stats on the left. As you can see, it's cruising at around 70-75 km per hour at only 2.2 to 2.3 amps. It was at this point I achieved the fastest speed so far with this model, 160 km per hour. I'm going to make some changes soon to try and get it close to that 200 mark, starting off probably with a more aggressive propeller. On this approach coming into land here, I think I just went a little bit too slowly. I reached a low speed of 43 km per hour and just lost my stability at that point. This plane likes to fly fast. Let's take another look at that awful landing from the viewpoint of my Insta360 camera. It was quite the cartwheel and the canopy was ejected but there was absolutely zero damage at all. So here's those stats on that final flight where you can see I reached the max speed of 160 and in the space of 5 minutes I covered nearly 5 kilometers, which is pretty good considering I only used 296 milliamps. I think if I wanted to try and fly economically I could probably get 10 to 15 minutes out of this plane. Anyway I hope you enjoyed this video or found it useful and I'm sure you'll see more from this plane with me shortly. Thanks for watching.